Uh, we already rocking the I'm just waiting for you, Andy. Hey, start. Yeah. I started it. It's the beginning. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm Andy Rowe. This is Peter Ford. Uh, I've been around Vegas Sports for five years. Hit the noise, thanks. Any noise, guys. Anyway, I got started about three, four years ago. Uh, the kid, I was, I was building a race car with my, my son, getting started. We were collecting parts. And one day he shows up on eBay with a squirt and says, Dad, you're going to have to learn it sooner or later, so let's do my car. Okay? It was a CRX, 9,000 RPM CRX, throttle bodies on the side. That's how I got started in this stuff. I've since done, I'm probably known for doing some real screwball stuff. I've got a jet ski on mass airflow. I've done a Hemi Cuda with a bolt-on kit type thing. Uh, been involved in several tunes. Uh, Pete was, I don't know, essentially a TV repairman sort of glorified. Got into repairing squirts because guys, you know, once one wouldn't come up, they killed it somehow. If you're a mechanical type guy, an engine builder, Electronics confuses you. You know, it makes your fingers tingle. So, you know, Pete found a niche of people. If you're, if you're just baffled, you can send it to Pete. He's, I think, one of the only guys around here that'll take a squirt from almost anywhere and try to repair it. Yeah, I'm pretty low standards of what I Yeah. Okay. So anyway, Pete will help you out if you get in, get in trouble in the electronic standpoint. But that's where we're coming from. We're, we're going to try to do a, what are you really getting into, okay? Of the 600-page manual, what are the stuff that when we wrote, read 10,000 post-sale past, what were the very common questions that we just kept seeing? Anything else, Pete? Right. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I guess I've done a lot of screwball installations, too, and you know, strange stuff. Prepare probably four or five of these a month. Um, but by the way, just as a tip, the ones that are the pre-made units of buying today are worse than the units that people build themselves because they've never thought of before. Just, if you think about buying a, a unit from a no-name seller on eBay, their construction is worse than, than you could make yourself as you miss a solder. They forget the solder stuff. You know, some kind of dorm room that's trying to get your That's right. Okay. So here you are looking at all these different squirts, and what are the problems? Let me go over to this side. Um, you know, what are we getting into? Well, the first thing you want to do is think about the problem you're trying to solve. Is it you've got a carburetor that no longer can be rebuilt? Is it you've got an LS1 motor that didn't come with the computer? You know, what problem are you trying to solve? It's a, excuse me? Could be. Um, you know, is it a factory ECU that you just can't find a tune for your twin turbos with your blower and a few other mods and nitrous and everything else? Mega Squirt may be able to pull that off. It's not an easy trick by any stretch, but the factory ECUs can get overwhelmed very quickly. Um, do you want to do fuel, ignition, or both? My advice is if you're truly a newbie trying to bring one of these things up and solder it up and figure out what's going on and how all these tables work and all that sort of thing. If you have a distributor that works, an ignition that works, and you can get a tax signal from, fuel is easier to take on. Okay? If you happen to have a junkyard motor and your street rod and all you got is this lump of LS1, you're going to have to take them both on at the same time. Can be done. It's just a little tougher. Um, the injection method. Basically, there's two styles of ways to get fuel in a motor. Either you dump it in somewhere at the throttle body, kind of like an old carburetor. The old General Motors used to do it all the time. Early Hondas did it. They just sprayed out a one or two injector in the middle, and fuel got around the intake manifold, kind of like it used to with a carburetor. Not like it used to. They later, almost every factory install for probably the last 10 or 15 years, has the injector very close to the intake valve. Fuel distribution gets a lot simpler. The problem is, if you're bringing up a, a 73 MGB, it's at least a challenge. 
Okay, you're going to have to somehow get those injectors in there. Um, I'd advise if you're not a real good fabricator, plan on maybe a good machinist friend or something. Those injectors have to be in there pretty straight. The biggest problem is eventually you've got to get fuel to them, mount them well. It's a bit of a challenge. It can be done. Lots of us have done it. Um, so, you know, that's just one of those things you're in for. Go ahead. Trigger method. Somehow the mega squirt has to get a tax signal. And that tax signal is gospel. If you don't have a good tax signal, you're in for one heck of a fight. And you'd never believe all the uh, data logs we've seen over the years that it can't possibly be turned into 1,000 RPM, 9,000, we're back at 1,000, 8,000. You know, there's noise. That's that noise thing we were talking about. There's, yeah. <laughs> he skirted the issue. He said somebody else will cover that one. That's right. There's several ways, quite a few ways, um, to get a tack signal. You can mount some sort of wheel on the front of the motor, get a trigger. We can go into it later, but... You know, get a trigger to read that thing, tell the squirt to read it. You can get Ford modules called EDIS, one of the most reliable and easy ways and junkyard pieces you can get to trigger one of these things. But you got to think about, especially if you're doing something crazy, a Kawasaki or a, a boat motor or something, some of that stuff, like especially the motorcycles, you can't find anything spinning. You know, how are you going to get a trigger wheel on this thing? Uh, trigger sensors. There's the points. If you've got an old distributor with a set of points, believe it or not, we can use that for fuel only. Let the points trigger the, the ignition. You can rock and roll. There's ways to do that. You can also get into Hall Effect. Cute little device. Think about this big. With metals in front of it, it gives out 5 volts. Well, you feed it ground in 12 volts, and then it gives out 5 or 12 volts, depending on the design of the thing. It's kind of neat. It's feeding back a square wave to the motor. Optical, Chrysler's do that. As I remember, there was a, an LED or something down in the distributor, and a little wall went past it and said, the wall's in front of me. Turn off the voltage. Oh, it's back. I can see through it. Kind of cool. VR, this is a device that's essentially a magnet with two wires on it. Anytime a piece of metal comes into it, the voltage goes up. As the metal goes past, the voltage comes down. Uh, we have a way to trigger from these things. It's very typical on the uh, brake sensors on almost all cars. You'll see what's known as the reluctant ring or the tone ring. It's just a bunch of little uh, metal teeth. And that thing that sits there, that's called the VR, variable reluctance device, I guess is the official name for the thing. And we can use those too. Uh, early, you'll have to figure out though, the, the whole point is, early, you have to figure out how you're going to do this, okay? If you've got no clue and you don't want to fabricate or you don't want to figure out how the, the factory device does it, you're in for a world of hurt, okay? You're going to ask a lot of newbie questions, and when it's, believe me, when you say, I've got an XYZ 3000, how do I do it? What do I need to buy? Remember I was telling somebody? The high-tech guys chime in if you got the tough questions. Those guys never chime in on those other than read the manual, and they, that's the end of the post. Okay? Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, yeah, read the manual. Code decisions. You, you probably are hearing MS1, MS2, MS Extra, MS This, Microsquirt, Megasquirt, all these different names, and you'll hear a lot of people, hey, what code are you running? What box are you running? Here's what they're talking about. Over the years, this thing's evolved several times. Basically, Bruce and Al put together the original architecture of the black box. Bruce does the electronics. Al brings on the code. They get it running. They lock it down and say, this thing's finished. We're done. It's pretty simple, at least originally back in the old days. It was fairly simple, but it works. We're done. And along come, a couple of Brits are walking around here. I don't know if they're here right now. They took on... Huh? They're writing code. They're in there, yeah, writing code. They don't want to listen to me, believe me. Basically, what they did is wrote the MS1 extra code. They figured out a way to hack in timing. Well, eventually, 
they found ways to tweak around this little bitty chip that they could go out to different pages. You hear about these page rights, all that sort of thing. They figured out a way to trick it farther than Al ever imagined originally. And somebody forgot to tell them they couldn't do it and they kept going. They ended up writing this thing called the MS1 extra code. It happens to have a limit of a tenth of a millisecond on the math calculations, that sort of thing, where eventually Bruce and Al came out with the MS2. The big claim to fame is this thing's four or eight or ten times faster, whatever the number was, and it can run more digits of significant calculation. It can run a little finer idle control. It was the biggest thing. Well, sure enough, along come the Brits, although one of the Brits kind of backed off a little bit, and Ken showed up. He happens to be a Linux programmer, X's and O's down in the guts of Linux. Okay, well, he took off like a duck in water and, and took on with one of James, the other Brit that was still in it, and they figured out a way to do MS2 Extra. What it was was added another 30 or 40 features, or 400 features, I don't know, I didn't actually count them. Basically did all their magic from the old Extra code and brought it into the new one. Now, the biggest thing that might get involved in this that we normally don't talk about, by the way, Microsquirt right here, what that is is a little box about that big cube. It's got a waterproof connector. If you're dealing with a motorcycle, a snowmobile, a jet ski, a boat, anything that humidity and water is an absolute nightmare, these little aluminum boxes that we're dealing with don't deal with it very well. Okay? The limit to micro squirt is it's very difficult to add a wire to it. It's all what's known as surface mounted. I don't know if you ever looked at your computer motherboard, the little bitty things on there and you have no idea how they connect them. Well, that's how that's done. That's how he got it down to a box this big. Unfortunately, you can't mod it. On these sort of boxes right here, we know them backwards and forwards and you can unwire, you unsolder this and put a jumper in there and bring this out here and out there. If you're that kind of guy, and you don't have a water issue, you'll be a lot happier with something other than the uh, micro squirt. The other thing that's, that's real big in this is this thing called the wheel decoder. What it is is a way to decode whatever the factory put on that timing wheel, and they can get really squirrely. Probably the worst one out there is Subaru, but Chevrolet does some strange things. Others just put you know, four, or eight, or ten bumps on this thing, and it's easy to decode. There's a mathematical way that Al elected to do it, that the extra guys decided to do it in a way that you had even math. Okay? The extra guys, you have to have, this is called a 36 minus 1. It's got 30, I don't know if you can see it, 36 teeth on it, but there's one tooth right there missing. Okay? What the extra guys decided is they wanted even math. So that anytime you divide by four cylinders, six cylinders, eight cylinders, all those basics, you ended up with a division that came out to an even number. The way Al did it made it so you could get all kinds of weird combinations. Well, if you happen to have a motor that's got a weird combination, Al's code the MS2 code may be your only option to decode it. Okay? I've run into that before. And all of a sudden, the physical logistics of what you're trying to fight may decide what code it is, not some feature that you like in this one or that one. You may not have a choice. Okay? And just point out, I have a typo. Um, MS2, uh, I believe that is the code that runs on Microsoft. It doesn't assume that is the code. Yes, like it's it's code exactly. That's, the yeah, that's, right. exactly. that's a typo on my part. It's supposed to be soon on for the NS2 Extra. And I have that in a copy. So it is the native code for Microsoft and the MS2. Uh, actually, I think what they're messing with in the other room is something blew up on the Microsoft, putting the extra code on, and they're in there trying to figure out what bits messed up somewhere. But, you know, that's why we put the question mark on it. Things tend to change. Somebody had their hand up at the back. Oh, hey, that's one of the guys who was doing the beta testing. I used to do a lot of beta testing two years ago. Man over here does it now. Okay, next. <sighs> Packaging. Basically, and I think this is a typo, 357 is a microscope, isn't it? 
Oh, there is. Okay. By the, oh, that's the surface. Okay. Okay. But I might push this one off to Bruce. I've been out of the loop for about a year. I bought a Harley and another motorcycle. I've been, you know, but if he wants to take it on. It's just a, it's a surface mount version of the uh, 3 board. It does not have a prototype area. Um, it's what DYI uses in the uh, Miata plug and play board. And uh, other than that, it's functionally, from what I can tell, equivalent to Yeah, what I did is you took the 3 three O board, um, and we'll go to the other 3 board. That's what most people have here. It's a four-layer board. I gave it to Bill and said we needed a surface mount version where a lot of the components you can make surface mount. And he whipped out a surface mount version. Some of the stuff you still have to solder through, but some, but a lot of it is now surface mount. And the reliability shot up because a big chunk of it's been it gets professionally installed. What about the 1.01 one board? <laughs> okay, 1.01. 1. Do people still have that? I think I got one. All right. Now I don't know if they'll be worth ten years from now. Probably nothing. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell. Well, there was a 0. 0.5 board that was on my car and in person the plane, so I still have it. Um, but the 2.2 was the first revolution one we came at. The two-layer board. Uh, it did what it, it did okay. Uh, we had a lot of problems. It didn't have any type of VR circuitry on it, and it did. And the injector drivers were mainly for high impedance. We tried to run low impedance before it blew up. So we put a little flyback board to make the board not the 2.2 board not blow up anymore. Well, noise got to us that good old noise issue, and we went to the V3030 board, which cleaned a lot of noise up. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Uh, and in the future, we will tweak the V3.0 board because it, it's getting you know a little bit long in the tooth, and we need to go back and do some cleanups on it, just to tweak her up a little bit. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's sort of the evolution as it is right now. Uh, sensors, O2 sensors. There's two basic styles of O2 sensors. There's wide band and narrow band. Wide band is a device that can measure from, I think, about 9 or 10 AFR all the way up through about 20. It depends on the device, I believe. But for the most part, it has plenty of range to go through startup, through lean enough to blow things up and knock and drive your neighbors nuts. Okay? They're fairly accurate. Um, they are also fairly critical to set up on your squirt. You can, you can teach them to give the wrong answer to the squirt. Okay? Um, you have to be fairly sure of yourself as you get started that you've got your device matched up well with the squirt you have. Okay? Ask a lot of questions on the net. The, the most common is one known as uh, company LM1 from Innovate. Uh, if you want the least problems, start with one of theirs. They're about three or four hundred bucks, four fifty. I don't remember. It's been a little while, but um, there's a small inline one. Doesn't really come with display or anything like that. I, don't know, I think they're a couple of hundred bucks for one channel. Yeah, one hundred ninety-nine or something. Uh, it's a very real option. Okay. Um, there's also narrow band. It's probably what ninety percent of the cars on the street have right now. Realistically, is extremely accurate and consistent at Stoch, 14.7. All it's really doing is smelling for oxygen. If it sees it, it says, you must have run out of fuel, so we still have oxygen, so you must be lean. Okay? If all the oxygen's gone, it says, we must be rich. Little rule, lean is low. Okay? And by the way, this thing reads out about zero to one volt. But 99.9% .9 of the time, it's real close to zero or real close to one. It spends very little time at what's known as the switchover point. We didn't do a graph of it. But they are very good for giving you an indication. Things like if you're trying to tune a car on a narrow band, you start climbing in the throttle, and you see it go lean, less than 14 volts. Holy cow, we're way lean. Back out of the throttle, add 10%, and all that area you saw it, and continue. It's a lot better than the old days of carburetors and saying, huh, that felt better. Okay? But it's still not gospel. Okay? Um, go ahead, I guess. Uh, coolant temp sensors, manifold temp sensors. Almost all factory installs have 
a coolant temp sensor, and a manifold air temp sensor. It turns up Megasquirt standardized on a GM one. Um, the reason we did that, they're dirt cheap at the auto parts store, and they're, you know, they're just readily available. You can get the connectors for them. You can, for 20 bucks, you can buy a whole pile of them at the junkyard. If you're doing an install from scratch, especially if somehow the stock ECU is still running your gauges or still running the radio or the turn signals or Lord knows what else that stock ECU does, and you want to keep that thing intact in the car, but you still want to run Megasquirt to run the fuel and our ignition, it really is easier. I don't care if you've got a Subaru. Figure out a way to get the GM sensors into the thing. By the way, they're just a plain old, I guess it's 3 8 pipe tap, maybe half inch, I don't remember. It is a 3 8 pipe tap. If you can find a way to put it in, um, intake air temperature, the manifold air temperature, in, in a normally aspirated, non-turbo car, you can put it almost anywhere. Lots of the factory just mount it somewhere in the intake. It's a, somewhere in the air filter. Others do it down in the intake. Theoretically, the closer you have it to one of the valves, the better off you are. The problem is you get into packaging issues and you want to drill a hole here and all sorts of other problems. So, you know, lots of us just mount in the air filter, close to the air filter. Motorcycles have them in the air filter all the time. As a matter of fact, a lot of cars do. Um, if you've got a turbo application, that remember that PV equals MRT, NRT? You start building boost, that's not a very efficient device, it'll build heat to the tune of 200, 250 degree air temperature sometimes. That really gets into the calculation. Then you run it through your intercooler on a cold day and it runs it all the way back down to 70, 80 degrees. That bottom line is that manifold air temperature has to be after you compress it and after you cool it back down, but before it goes in the motor. That is huge on turbocharged, supercharged, or any other charged type motor. Um, by the way, we'll talk about it later. This uh, degrees thing, uh, technically, uh, here we go, the button. This little chart, what that is, is that's the GM. Uh, sensor uh, resistance based on temperature, okay? It turns up you can, I don't know if it's really worth going much farther than that, but you know, that's the table that we're set up to. One thing I would add is um, you can play a little bit loose with the coolant temperature sensor because those tables are all relative, you know, whatever, as long as you don't care exactly what the temperature is, you want a table it work. So the air temperature is critical because that's your air density calculation, right. so that has to be accurate for the system to track over a wide range of intake air temperatures. If it doesn't, it's not going to track. So it is critical, and that's why I recommend GM if you can use it. By the way, oddly enough, that same response curve is the same for the both of the GM sensors. They look very different, but they've got the same curve. Oh, go ahead. Throttle position sensor. It turns up on... I guess most, if not all, of the codes. It's possible to build a car and tune it to work without one entirely, if you want. They're awful nice to have, but if you happen to be doing a 65 MGB, for example, it may be kind of difficult to get one in there. It is possible to work around that. There's essentially two styles of throttle position sensor. The ones we're looking for start out at about 100 ohms or so. This is all adjustable, but it needs to be around 100 ohms when you're completely out of the throttle, and as you roll in the throttle, it goes to around 5,000 ohms. Those exact numbers don't make much difference, but if yours goes from 3 ohms to 5, or goes from 0, and then all of a sudden jumps to infinite, infinite, okay, there's all kinds of other ones out there. So if you're going around the junkyard, voltmeter on the thing, play around with it a little bit, make sure it sweeps from about 100 to 5,000. By the way, there is a way to miswire them. We'll get into that later, but it's not going to blow anything up. I don't think there's a way to plumb the thing that will blow anything up. But you'll find it real quick when you go to try to start the car. Uh, map sensors. We've essentially got two or three styles of the things. Um, from the factory, normally aspirated cars, we have a 250 kPa version by default. If you're running, what that really means is 100 kPa. The 
Does this thing KPA throw a few people? What is this? This number? Excuse me? Well, yeah, but if you're an engineer, that kind of... Basically what it means, if you think of it, 100 KPA is 100% air, assuming you're standing on the coast, somewhere near the ocean, sea level, on I think it's a 63 or 58 degree day or some other such, I don't know, maybe 62, I don't remember, it doesn't matter much, okay? It's a standard at sea level. If you get, we'll have a table later, if you're trying to do a tune and you're starting at Pikes Peak, it's like 65 kPa or 0.65% of the air at sea level. Now, if you want to argue with me, you're off by about a percent, but don't worry that. I, I'm not sure how that, it's really, I think, 101 kPa at sea level. Yeah. One, one K, 100 kPa is 14.7 pounds. And then for an actual intersensor, what they do is they suck one atmosphere out of it. So it actually goes from minus one atmosphere up to like I want to So an absolute sensor, a differential sensor basically goes from atmosphere to zero up to whatever it goes to. An absolute sensor has one atmosphere sucked out of it. And in the pressure sensor, they actually on one side of the diaphragm, they suck the atmosphere out of it. So that goes below sea level. Sea level is 14.7 pounds. It goes from there. So that's that basically goes from minus 14.7 up to whatever one and a half times 14.7 is not 20. Yeah, about 21 and a half pounds boost. So if you're doing a boosted car, you're only going to pull eight pounds of boost. You can use a stock squirt the way they come from like DIY. It works just fine. If you're going to be running three atmospheres or you know 45 psi, that's where you get into this stuff. You get into setup issues. Uh, it's one of those at this point, read the manual. But you can set it up, make it work, but you got to modify your board a little bit. Pete. And just to give you an idea on the below 100 kPa, what, what's going on there, my car idles at about 37, 38 kPa. That's, you know, in a lot of cars, like 32, 33, they're in better shape, not so few. But, you know, that's that's kind of in inches of vacuum, I don't know what inches of vacuum that is. Yeah, so it's like ten yeah, so that's that's where that correlates to. So uh, normally after a car full load, you know, wide open throttle, it's atmosphere to hundred kPA or ninety eight if you've got you know ninety to allow the air filter. But that's a measurement of your load and absolute vacuum most engines won't pull that. A oh, fun party trick is to pass on an absence to see how much you can suck. <laughs> <laughs> you missed it last time. <laughs> but bottom line is on this KPA thing, if you think about the world is about 100 when you're near sea level, and at idle you run or 100% air, and when you're on the top of a mountain, it's about 50, 60% air. And at idle, you got 30 kPa or about 30% air in the intake. Okay? Uh, you may have heard about this thing called the stim. What are we talking about? Well, the lights aren't on, but almost all of us sitting around because we don't have a motor connected, we've got all these little red, red lights going. What that thing is, is a device with knobs on it that can adjust RPM and you can pull. Sure. Okay. But he can grab the RPM knob. He can grab, uh, and you can see the pulse width change. He can grab the temp, coolant temp knob, any knob, and I'm going to throw him at him in the wrong order, so he's going to be guessing which knob he's supposed to grab in the dark. There's the coolant up in the top right corner. There's a manifold air temp. Okay. And. You have a map there somewhere? By the way, turn on the, um, where is it where you can see all the gauges in the bar graph? Under what, tools? Tools, real-time display? Tools, over to the right. Oh, there it is. Okay. And I don't know what altitude we're at. We're not particularly high, but somewhere up. There's the map. Remember I said it's sea level? Right now we're running about 100% there in the top right corner, really 97, 98, because we're probably at about 400 feet. You know, and it's, yeah, it's a little over 64 degrees and a few other things. Right. 
but you can literally see as he's playing with the throttle position sensor. And it turns up, as I was saying before, you can measure how fast he's spinning the, the knob called TPS dot. It's, uh, you know, how fast is he spinning it? You can do it with the manifold air pressure drop. How quickly is the manifold air pressure approaching 100? You must have gotten in the throttle hard. So anyway, and we'll get into it later, but this is one of the things you do when you go to start up a brand new squirt, one of the very first things you do is verify after you actually check resistance on a whole lot of wires, make sure you're not feeding five volts where you're or 12 volts where you're not supposed to. Then you get into this thing and say, is that number I'm looking at make reasonable sense? Is it really 190 in my garage? I doubt it. Something's wrong with that temperature sensor. Okay? You gotta get all those to a reasonable number before you try to start the car. Um, so anyway, purchase a stim. What that gives you the ability to do is play in the privacy of your own living room at 10, 30, 11, 12 o'clock at night when your wife wants you to go to bed and you'll be sitting there playing with those knobs and adjusting things, okay? You have no idea how many people will, will post and say, why won't my car run? And you say, well, what's it doing on the stim? What's a stim? Have you done a data log? What's a data log? I mean, we're just... It's instant. Read the manual, guys. You got a lot more to learn yet. Uh, fuel pressure gauge. What I like to do is mount a fuel pressure gauge somewhere in the engine compartment. Don't bring a hose into the passenger compartment, okay? Do it in the engine compartment somewhere. When you build your fuel system, however you do it, find a way to tap it in. And I like it so that if I take off the hood, set it in the front yard, rev the motor around, what? That's not my problem. You've got a BMW, they're always tough to take apart. That's why they charge so much. But bottom line is, what I've found over the years is you'll get in the throttle and all of a sudden about 4,000 hits and starts pulling hard and you watch your 42 or 45 PSI gauge drop to 25. Well, it, somebody will make a post and I've got my VE run up to 190%. Well, guess what? It's trying to account for this lack of fuel pressure. You've got a fuel pump problem. You've got a dirty filter, your fuel lines are too small, something's wrong, and the only way to catch that easily is to have a gauge you can see when you climb on the power. <coughs> have it so you can plug it up, because you don't hate to shake that, those gauges all that hard. You, don't, you won't need it after the first couple of days, weeks, first time on the dyno, if you take it to a dyno. Those numbers don't change much. If, by some chance, three years later, your race car just went super lean, it's awful nice to go pop that on and say, huh, I wonder if something went wrong with my fuel pump. Uh, buy a voltmeter right off the get-go. Doesn't have to be particularly um, fancy. It's really nice to have one that does frequency and all that sort of thing, but the, the $30 Radio Shack one will probably do just fine. I don't know exactly how much they are, but they're not real. They're really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, try buy a pretty decent one. 100 bucks will buy you plenty. A little fluke, a basic fluke is great. They're indestructible. You drop it the first time, it doesn't shatter. Um, a laptop with a serial port. It turns up, when, when we started this whole project, what, 10 years ago? Not we, but I, I wasn't involved. But that was the standard way you connect up things. Since then, it's getting very difficult to get a laptop especially new. I happen to have one. I had to give $1,600 for it to get a serial port. They're getting very rare. Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, who knows when that's going to go away. Uh, it tends to be, I, if you really want a cool laptop, look at a Panasonic Toughbook. They are tough. It's what all the cops use. The reason it's probably got serial port is probably their radars still connect to them or something. I don't know. But they're really cool. Uh, but they're about 1600 bucks, so I managed to charge mine off to work, and they didn't know I had a serial port that was worth, you know, 600 bucks extra. But um, the USB stuff, they tend to be rather flaky. Um, DIY, since they've done Lord knows how many installs, they probably have one that's pretty darn bulletproof. The Radio Shack works every time. Does it? Radio Shack? Every time. That's fine, actually. I don't have... I haven't seen stability problems with them. 
Um, it depends on certain model of them. I found that the cheaper ones to work better than the main brand. I don't, I don't know what the pattern is, but you know, if you don't want to fight it, these guys have one that they use a lot that they probably almost always can fight their way through. There was also a bug in Megatune prior to 225 P3 that initialized the serial port a little screwy, which could actually confuse some new things. Yeah. I should add that um, I'm involved in the audiovisual industry also, and there's a number of programmable mixers and equalizers that also need serial ports. And there are guys selling, there are companies selling $200 USB adapters that don't work, and they tell you to go to Radio Shack and buy it. So there, it's a problem, of pro not just in this industry, but everybody this problem. You know, USB is at the heart because it's, it's translating into a serial, virtual serial port. And, um, you know, even if you put it on board, you know, we're talking about putting USB on board, it comes with a chip that becomes a virtual thing and, and they can also have problems. So, actually, now you at least have a, a choice of unplugging a cable and putting a cable feed. So if you put something on the board and it doesn't work in the laptop, it's hard to rip your board apart and put another prolific serial chip versus another type. Yeah. Prolific works pretty good. Uh, it's that PDI that works or that'll work on other laptops well, and not on this one. You know, it's uh, it depends what's loaded on your machine. If the moon's over here versus there, it's just lots of real physical reasons like that. In addition to the issues with some of the laptops that have a hard version of work on I know someone by the way, out on eBay, used laptops, especially slow laptops, have no resale value. And almost anything will run uh, most of these programs. They're not real processor intensive. You don't have much going on. So you can format an older computer if you can find the software to bring it back up fresh. So it's nice, clean install. Um, the other thing is if you only gave $250 for the thing and you left it in your car and forgot to lock the car because you'll end up carrying your laptop all the time messing around with your, your squirt. Uh, if it gets broken into, you only lost your $250 Dell that you got on eBay. You know, your $1,600 with all your work software on it, you'll hate to lose. So that, that might be a real option for a few more years until that market dries up. But they won't still get mega switches. Yeah, not normally. I haven't heard a story. Somebody did. Okay. Okay. Um, this is some of that upfront how much horsepower am I trying to make? What can I realistically expect out of an LS1 or whatever it is? Never expect, if you had a good running carburetor carburetor or a carburetor car that was pulling 300 horse, you might get 310 out of fuel injection unless the carburetor was really screwed up, okay? It's not a magical end all make horsepower that the carburetor left on the table. What you can do is get far better drivability than the carburetor ever thought of having. Okay? So, get an idea. If you can find a torque curve off of somebody else's motor that's very similar to yours, at least you'll know where the torque curve is going to change quickly. That's where you make a lot of bins for your RPM range. Uh, it'll give you a hint what you're up against. Uh, the other thing is picking your fuel injectors. Uh, there's a company out there, RC Engineering, that's got a fairly simple calculator for uh, fuel injectors. Give you an idea how big you need. By the way, the, the Japanese companies tend to rate them in cc's, or I don't know, cc's per minute or hour or whatever it is. Anyway, it's cc's. Uh, you'll see numbers in the neighborhood of like 100 to 4 or 5 or 6 or 700. Uh, if you divide that by 10, you're pretty close to the American way of rating them, which is like 20, 19 pounds for a low horse V8, like a, a, you know, a small V8, be about 19 pound injectors or around 190 cc injectors. Really big stuff is in the 800 cc or 80 pound, and that's huge. Um, I've got a calculator out there on the net. Uh, it's kind of tuned for the way we look at things. The RC engineering one ignores RPM. Um, 
which is not a big deal if you only turn in 6,000 RPM. If your motor happens to spin 12,000 RPM, that opening time on the injector gets very significant. If you're doing a two-stroke, hugely significant. And my calculator has everything in terms that you'll be used to, after you read the manual seven times, you'll be used to the terms that are in my calculator. That's on my site, by the way. Uh, low Z, um, oh, another little tip. If you can find a motor very similar to yours from the factory that has the same sort of RPM range, same sort of horsepower you're looking for, if you can grab the injectors out of there, it's a great start because, you know, a lot of these numbers aren't real obvious as to how big of an injector that really is. If you're close to the torque curves and horsepower curves of the motor you stole them out of, it should be pretty good. Uh, there's this thing, low Z, high Z injectors or impedance. What that means for us simple-minded mechanicals is if you take your voltmeter and put down on the two leads on the injector, if you see about two ohms, plus or minus a little bit, you've got low impedance injectors. If you see about 12 or 14 ohms, you've got the high impedance. What that means for you is the low impedance take huge electrical loads, big fuses, hot wires, it's a big load on, on the squirt. You gotta know you've got low impedance injectors. I don't wanna go into all the details of setting that up because you know, it gets too overwhelming, all the information. But if you've got those two ohm injectors, you gotta deal with it. You'll let the smoke out of your box if you don't know how to deal with it, okay? It's easy, but you just got to know. Um, starting with a known running car. Pete and I can't even begin to know a whole lot of guys. These guys, tech support line. I just built myself a new blown supercharged XYZ 6 million, and we just built it, and it's a $9,000, you know, pro motor, and I want to score it. What's going to happen to you is you go to start it, after you do all the checkout, which we'll go through, no, 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 nothing. Okay, or it sputters, farts, a couple of noises out the exhaust. Huh, must be the squirt. Well, guess what? After a while, three days of playing, you're going, I wonder if the cam's in the right direction. I wonder if it's the right cam. I wonder if I've wiped the lobe off the cam. I wonder if the distributor is three teeth wrong and everything is screwed up, okay? If you can start with a known running motor, to squirt it, it's a huge advantage because at least you know the cams in there straight. Most of us that do tuning on the side, or a lot of us, will show up with a voltmeter in one hand and a compression gauge in the other. And if you fail the compression test, I'll be back later when you fix that problem. Believe me, it happens all the time. And what you'll find is your idle's a mess, you're seeing noise, what you think is noise. It's piston two is missing, guys. The guy that sold this thing to you had seven pistons. Okay, it happens. Uh, go ahead. Wiring. Again, another one of those, I know I keep saying all this stuff is huge. Wiring is a big deal. What I like to do is there's these crimp on connectors that have heat shrink on either end. It's a built in, all in one. So what you do is slide the wires in, crimp them with your good tool, which we'll get into that in a minute. You gotta pay at least $30, $40 for a crimping tool. It's not the $3 Walmart one, okay? There are pro build, or, you know, the, the pros use crimpers. There are also the military stuff, airplane spec, but it tends to run three, four, 500 bucks. I don't own one, I've got the $70 device. Ah, it's probably 35. Um, but what, happens is when you bring those wires in, if you don't have the heat shrink version, you end up with a big stress wiser as that wire vibrates on your motor and you will slowly eat through the wires a couple days, couple weeks, couple months, eventually that connection will go bad on you. What the heat shrink does for you is one, keeps, especially if you're in the Midwest, salty environment, it keeps the salt out of that connection and it keeps it so your wire is supported by the covering. I really like the things, I've, I've done the jet ski that way for what it's worth. I have not opened up my jet ski that I did, I put it in a waterproof black box, I can show you if anybody wants to see it later. But once I soldered up the squirt, put it together, I've only had that box apart once. And it's because the power died during a 
during a reburn and damned if I had to pull it out. But it's buried in my ski. Called Bruce one day, is that my only choice of putting the jumper on? He goes, yeah, why? And I start, what's wrong? It's a three hour proposition to get to the dang thing, you know? But um, since I've built the ski, I haven't had a single wire go bad. There's nothing in the squirts gone bad. And I'm bouncing all the waves at 9,000 RPM, 7,000 RPM. It's a bad environment. These can be done. Um, wire colors and quality. Here's a little trick. The guys that do the overhead cranes in big factories, they've got a, a control box that the guy that operates it walks behind and is, you know, north and south and east, west and up, down and all that sort of thing. It's got a cable coming down to it about that big around. The guys that repair these in your town, find out who repairs cranes, go by there, tell them what you're doing, and tell them you need about five foot of that cable, eight foot, 10 foot piece. You slice it down the side. I can get you the brand. I can add it to this PowerPoint. I didn't bother to check. I've got a buddy in the industry. When you slice the casing off, out pops 24 silicone wrap. It's like 40 strand or something wire, high temperature, all color coded, all the same length, and it's beautiful stuff. Okay? Do not use the Walmart wire. The stuff is not rated for heat. And you are in for a heap of trouble eventually with the stuff. Okay? Um, Want to change tapes? Yeah, the automotive rated, it turns up the silicone stuff is great. By the way, we need to take a break. Apparently, the tape may not. Okay. Do you want me to demo this while we're taking a break? Do you want to wait till he tapes it? Demo. Sure, Should if you something. want. Yeah, matter of fact, while we've got the lights on, why don't we go to my tubing vendor and uh, wire routing. Please plan ahead as you wire up a car. Make sure you remember the path that this wire is going to go. Think it out three or four times. Have it all color coded. It's a nightmare to be troubleshooting a bundle of wire this big that's all black. Um, the, the distributors carry generic wiring harnesses right. that are coming. Yeah, we've got a couple pictures that we're going to go into. Okay. Step-by-step okay. um, -step DB37 verification. What this is, is the DB37 is that big gang connector that goes into the side of the squirt, same place where the uh, stems go in. Pete's got, I think, on the next, or uh, real soon, coming up. Hey, Pete, pay attention, buddy. Go ahead, snap it. There you go. Uh, by the way, that's my homemade way to buy at the auto parts store, the relay setup. Uh, basically, it's just two relays, two connectors you can buy, uh, a couple inline fuses, and we'll probably post this picture out on this. You can see it again later. I can't explain it right now, but it's just a cheap way to do the relays. Next, this is uh, Pete has these made for BMW. These guys DIY have one very similar that I believe already has the DB37 soldered on. If you've got a very standard install, it takes a lot of the pain out of doing the wiring, especially if you're bringing a car up from scratch. Uh, this is a checklist. Basically what you're doing is starting with a voltmeter, have the squirt laying on the floor, ignition turned off, you're checking for resistance where resistance ought to be. I can post this checklist. We'll, we'll put the checklist out. For the Mega Man. Maybe you yeah. go through now. I'll just post okay. the list. But, you know, it's the kind of thing like how to check for resistance that the TPS really is wired correctly before you feed 5 volts back into the 12 volt and you just smoked an entire section of your squirt. By the way, when the smoke leaks out, it's usually the guy wiring it up. It's that first three seconds of the install. I followed this whole list and brought a, a new install up in an hour and, and it ran perfectly. There was no unknowns because I was confident that everything worked. I just a couple weeks ago did a fast track and it came right up because, you know, I knew that the harness was made right. I, I do exactly the same thing. If somebody says, well, you, you know, I finally got it wired. Will you help me start it? The first thing I do is put the squirt somewhere on a table and start checking wires. Um, <laughs> tuning. Uh, there's this thing called speed density, alpha N, mass airflow. Uh, speed density, the original squirts were all designed with speed density as the primary way to set that up. Basically what it is is calculating the air density and the speed of the motor. Okay, Alpha N, 
is an older style. It's, it's great for finicky race cars that come right off the dyno onto the racetrack, but if you start climbing mountains and stuff, it's just a calculation based on the angle of the throttle and the, the speed of the engine. They are very finicky. Um, if you look at the Mega Manual, Lance just scares the absolute you know what out of you that don't even try it. This is for crazy and brave people. Uh, mass airflow. We don't talk about it much. The new MS2 stuff can't accommodate it. I don't hang around the site enough to know if somebody's actually got a few of them running. I did it. Okay, there are a few of them out there, and it's it's bulletproofed. And okay, I I have one personal vehicle, the jet ski, at which would not work. I blew about half a summer on Alpha N and speed density. Actually, speed density lasted about 12 seconds on a data log. I went to Alpha N, tuned for about four months, and then that's when I met the Brits and talked to them all the time until we got mass airflow running. I now do it on uh, the Hemi Kuda's got mass airflow, and so does the race car. Once you understand it, it's cool stuff. Um, target air fuel verifier timing. Really? Oh, uh, one thing, timing. You'd never believe, and I think there was going to be a demo later on how to set up timing. It's, a, it's one of those things that's not very well understood. My advice is get a cheap timing light right off the get-go. I want one with no knobs on it, okay? Because the knobs will drive you crazy. And what I do is on a new install, I'll wire tie it into the chassis somewhere with a wire tie on the trigger and hardwired to the battery. And every time that thing starts, I can see the flashing on the front pulley. Because what you'll find, this noise thing, instead of the timing mark sitting there right at 10 degrees or 15 or 20 you're expecting, you'll see a flash over here and it's back. And another flash over here. Those are all noise issues. That doesn't uh, work quite well with EDIS. EDIS. Wasted part, wasted part. Why, Why would that be? You have to cut them in half. Cut them what? Cut them in half, right? Cut. It doesn't matter because it's far in the same crankshaft position. No. Oh, you're talking about like a, a timing back? Remember I started out with a cheap timing light, a Walmart $9 timing light? There's no knobs on it. There's no calculations for degrees. There's no setup manual. It's a clip-on, two wires on the battery, and wire tie it down to the chassis. It will never screw you up. I hate to tell you how many times I've, ah, the timing slipped seven degrees. What's going on? And you find out somebody slipped on the knob and just pulled the knob. Right. Yeah, I had trouble triggering with EDIS coils and even my old Craftsman dumb. They're not really a good solution for it yet. But actually, I, I got I got a top and light that's got a two stroke. Oh, it's got four stroke and two stroke. Put it on two stroke for the place. So I thought that was a calculation. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. If you move the, the 12 volt on your two stroke, take away the ignition coil. The 12 volt is driven by either a minor like an ignition point uh -huh. or built in there. Go get a high power LED flashlight from. Uh, Walmart, or wherever, you know, they have collectors to wire that in there. You set your dwell like one or two milliseconds, it's enough to flash it to act, and it's going through the electronics and pull that wire line. You've got to build the top line. We're talking about this thing? $15? If you just so fly back, you can just take away the coil. Oh, you mean just for cranking? Right. Just for cranking, just to see if you're going to... Oh, yeah, it won't work if you think, but you can do it as a uh, setup, initial setup. Yeah, don't do it with the initial setup. Yeah. Take some more clothes out, you know, for cranking. Yeah, but you can use that as a, as a little, well, you know, just use it. We were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Bottom line is, if that spark is not showing at 10 degrees top dead center, and you're seeing it flash all over the place, and you've also got an erratic idle and backfiring through the intake, it's probably a pickup. That VR sensor we talked about earlier, too wide, too close, it's bouncing off the crankshaft, something's going wrong if you see that timing flashing all over the place. Um, Basic tuning, uh, basic tuning early. This thing we keep talking about noise. One of the dead giveaways is data log. Learn to data log. When you're going through your checklist and you actually do bring power on this thing, you start running your throttle up and down. You start, you know, whatever. Do a data log. Make sure you can data log. Make sure you can read it. Okay? You have no idea how many people come in. My motor doesn't run well. What's wrong? It's got to be the code. It's all blown up. You go post a data log. How do I do that? Uh-oh, you haven't read the manual. 
Okay, it's really important. Uh, the other thing is, if you're seeing 2,000 RPM, you just fired the motor up, sounds good, sounds right, and all of a sudden you see a spike to 4,000 and back to 2,000, and you see one down at 500 and back to 2,000, bam, 9,000 back. Those are timing issues. I bet you if you put the timing light on, you'll also see them jumping around. Um, get your VE, there's a, I don't know if we need to have time really to go into some of this stuff. Yeah, the, the VE, there's this thing called acceleration enrichment that detects when your foot's moving quick, whether or not you do it on the intake air, or air pressure or you're doing it on the throttle position sensor, it adds fuel. Back those numbers way off early. They'll really confuse you. How come I'm rich and I'm backing it off and it's your dirty throttle position sensor. It keeps kicking this thing at long story short. Turn that stuff down and take care of noise issues very quickly. If you can't figure it out, by the way, shielded wire, microphone wire is what the, the electronic stores call it. It's very good for very low voltage stuff like these VR sensors. We could get into how the triggering works but it's very sensitive to electronic noise. If those wires that go to that VR sensor in the front of the motor happen to run dead parallel with one of your spark plug wires, it will drive you nuts and you'll never get the car to run until you figure out what's going on. It's electrical interference in those wires. Um, one real weird quirk about motors is very lean feels a lot like very rich because they can both put out the fire, okay? and O2 sensors are completely, totally unreliable when you have a misfire because the fuel didn't light, it didn't burn the oxygen, and what's coming down the exhaust is unburned air, unburned fuel and air that still has oxygen. A miss will drive you nuts, okay? Um, but backfiring, we used to be able to take the old CRX, go down a big hill, you know, overrun, downshift, bah, you know, and it go bow, 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 bow. And I could sit there and run the VE up, and it'd start backfiring, and it'd get better at stoach, and you'd start going lean, and it'd start backfiring, and you start going rich, and it'll backfire. It'll backfire on both sides, rich and lean. So anybody says, you got overrun, it's lean, it's got to be lean. No. What I've got is a misfire. We've got to figure out why the motor's not firing. And what happens is, this fuel and air ends up in the exhaust system, the next cylinder over, fires. Guess what lights beautifully? All that stuff that's down in your exhaust system. It's the next cylinder that hits, lights it. There's also a weird quirk that lean or a misfire can backfire up through the intake. Uh, the Harley World calls the carb farts. What it is is if you've got wasted spark and when the piston came up on compression top dead center or close, fire, tried to fire and missed, the next time around doing the exhaust stroke, Wasted spark means another spark's coming at the spark plug. If you've got burnable fuel there, both valves are open, and you're going to have flames heading both directions. Yeah, yeah, all kinds of nasty things could happen. But, you know, it, this lean miss, you know, a lean miss or a rich miss can be very confusing. If, if don't trust those O2s in a miss because they will confuse you to death. Okay? Now, as it's coming up, it's getting leaner, 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 and then all of a sudden it gets to a misfire. Yeah, right before the misfire, you probably were lean. Just a little warning on those O2 sensors. Um, when does a motor need to start getting rich? Remember the percent air? At idle, you're running about 30% air, 30 kPa. As you're running up the highway, you're in the 50, 60, 70 kPa range. Full throttle, you're up in the 95, 97, depends on the altitude you're at, okay? It will never get higher than the pressure is when the motor's dead. But somewhere around 80 kPa is when the motor's really starting to make serious power, and that's when you better start getting away from 14.7 and adding fuel. The general rule is most motors make best power at 100 kPa at about 12 to 13 AFR. 13.2, something like that. It depends a little bit on your meter and the gasoline and the grace of God and a little luck, okay? But at 80 kPa, it's about the time you start rolling on the fuel and getting richer. What my rule of thumb is, if, if you were allowed to drive one of these cars on the street, okay, which you're not, EPA doesn't like 
squirted cars, but whatever it is that you do 70 mile an hour at, whatever that airflow over the car, the load, on a level road, you probably want 14.7 or pretty close. But as soon as you start rolling into what feels like acceleration or you start rolling into a big hill, start rolling on the fuel and I'll bet you it's about 80 kPa, something like that. Fuel economy will die if you start running on the fuel at 70 mile an hour. You know, you get 12 mile a gallon or whatever. By the way, my kids old CRX on GSXR throttle bodies and 9,000 RPM motor pulled well from 1,500. It didn't quit till 9,000 and he one day with a tailwind got like 53 mile a gallon going back to school. Okay? It can be done. By the way, this is tuning for mileage. You know, tuning for power, is it the same thing? Yeah, pretty much. Because, again, that 70, 80 kPa and, and more vacuum, you know, down to the idle, it's 14.7. Or even leaner on some of these motors can go really pretty lean if you're out of the throttle going downhill. By the way, there is a weird thing we've got in the extra code. I don't know if that code has it, else code has it. You literally turn the fuel off on overrun. If you do a downshift, fuel is completely off, zero pulse width. Save like two mile a gallon if you turn the fuel and overrun. Al, does yours? You don't do that. That was something we put in the extra code. I'm not sure if the MS2 extra code. Well, there, there is a decel. I mean, uh, I don't, there is a decel in there, but I don't think you can cut it off entirely. Okay. Uh, there's a way to do it in the VE tables, which is the way we found out. We ended up putting timers in the old MS1 extra code. Works beautiful, uh, but Honda, uh, my wife had, by the way, for what it's worth, my wife's Honda RSXS, you know, Honda at its finest, 8,000 RPM street motor, and my kids, CRX on these big, huge throttle bodies, it drove every bit as smooth as my wife's RSX. They really can. X completely will run to zero? Okay. But anyway, it's just a little trick you can do. You can also do it in the VE tables. I know I've kind of run over. Um, this is on the site, and I think we're going to post it up there. This, yeah, that's what I'm doing. You can do it in the VE table, just a certain section of the map. You've got to put really close numbers on the RPM. It's, you know, if you're greater than this, high vacuum. Yeah, it's, there's possible ways to do it. Um, this is a mechanical engineer trying to put into English that everybody understands, like, you know, sweat on the side of a, a cold beer of why AE acceleration enrichment is required. Um, I've had quite a few comments over the years of all of a sudden people understood what was going on. X tau, which is another way of doing acceleration enrichment, is basically all this stuff wrapped up into a formula. Beyond the basic installation, there's a stuff called CAN network, router boards, all that kind of stuff. Basically what that is, is if you guys understand networks at work, how they send little packets off to other computers. Basically what this is, is the main Megasquirt has the ability to say, hey, right at the moment I happen to be at 4,200 RPM, send that out on the network, and if anything else out there wants to know that bit of information, it can use it for its own calculations. Kind of cool stuff. Stuff's coming down the pipe. Uh, it's basically how a Mazda RX-8, the whole network works on that stuff. It's what controls your radios, your turn signals, your all kinds of stuff. Really neat. Sequencer is a really cool little device that runs timing, eight cylinders, individual timing, eight sparks, individual timing, and a few other things. And when these guys get it done, I'll probably start playing with it. But that stuff's all in the pipe, and it's stuff that, as far as we know, our competitors, so to speak, don't touch. They're not even thinking about it. Um, this little gadget, um, basically what that is, is I found it out on the net surfing one day. It's that DB37 slides in the back of the squirt, and it makes screw-on terminals for all your DB37s. Okay, are all your terminals. It's great if you're just playing and you're not sure how you want to set this thing up and you don't want to spend all the time to make that little connector that's all bulletproof and cool. This thing is a little screw down terminal. 
I warn you, in the long run, the thing kind of hangs out there and it's easy to screw up. But boy, for testing, or if you do a lot of testing with a squirt in your you know, garage or your kitchen or whatever it is, neat little device, about 50 bucks. Um, I don't know if we have time to take questions. I don't know if we want to take the time. Excuse me, what? That little gizmo? It just doesn't sign any. It's got real thin traces on it. I know from personal experience, you don't want to run a whole bunch yeah, of I don't know if it's a long-term solution, but... Well, trust me, it doesn't, the traces don't last very long. So okay. you, have, you, I, like four you know, now I happen to run high impedance injectors, so I don't have the big loads on my injectors. Uh, and I'm not running ignition on the car that I was... I had this, oh yeah, one of them is. I had not run into the problem, but. Hup, back one. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yep, Contron is the company. I, the only place I've ever found it is direct from them. It's about 50 bucks or something. But I used to do a lot of beta testing for guys, and, you know, it was just easier on the test bench to have all my jumper wires bolted to that. Any other questions? You mentioned your website or whatever. Or what, and my website? Or your, your website or something or you're talking about. Well, yeah, you had a calculator. Oh, oh, it, it's just, I, I happen to work for a construction company, and since I run the network, I have an address out there for this. Uh, if you want to write that down, you want to go back to it. It's www.ncs, like Nancy Charlie Sam, hyphen stl.com slash, I think it's fuel with, yeah, it's down with a lowercase f, I believe. I don't know that anybody, it's, there it is. Slash fuel in a lowercase f, and you'll see it. It's the only thing out there. And it shows how the calculation is run out to the right. So if you want to question it as to where did I get this crazy number of, you know, gallons per millisecond or whatever it is, you can see how I did the calc. Anything else? Realistically, uh, if you're a good eBay junkyard buyer, uh, almost all these stalls end up running about a grand. That's about 400 for the squirt. If you got to buy injectors, that's about 300. Uh, a few connectors, wires, wireless, you know, the, all the stuff, you'll blow away the rest. And I, I budget, if you're pretty good at doing that kind of thing, about a grand before you get into tuning. Now, if you got to if you got to pay a dyno guy for six hours to learn how Megasquirt works, it gets really expensive really quick. A guy like Jerry can probably dial one in pretty darn close, probably in, I don't know, an hour or something. This thing, what they are is high pressure tubing that they use in the hydraulics, pneumatics world. Um, what this thing does is it has the ability to take stainless tubing that's about, I think it's about a buck a foot. It's no worse than high pressure fuel injection tube. This little device is about two, three hundred bucks, but the cool part is most of the distributors, if you pay the three hundred bucks, you can borrow it for three days, a used one, and bring it back and they'll credit you the three hundred bucks. Okay, if you don't bring it back, they got full price for a used one. Basically, this thing works really, uh, this definitely falls under the cool tool. You got the stainless steel tubing. All you do is clamp it down, and you can bring on a 90 degree bend. Nothing to it, okay? What these things have is little ferrules you buy. It's a connector, about the same price as AeroQuip. If you want to do air equipped stainless lines, it's no more expensive than that by any stretch. 
And what they are is this piece. Unfortunately, somehow it disappeared yesterday. I hit one laying around here. You slide on a like a barrel threaded gizmo, a couple ferrules, the piece, this whole thing sells for about four or five bucks, eight bucks, bulkhead fittings, you can buy them in stainless, brass, all kinds of things. You tighten up the slack, one and a quarter turns, and it's guaranteed to the pressure of the tubing. I do all my race cars in this stuff, all the hydraulic lines, I now do fuel lines. The little stuff, the 3 16th line, you can bend in your fingers, you get up to this, you need the cool tool. But I've done whole cars in this. I brought a Hemi Cuda, real Hemi Cuda, a million dollar car. Guy wanted it fuel injected. Two of us brought the car into my garage and one week later was all plumbed in this stuff, mega squirted the whole thing, all the wiring, and we were only working nights about two hours a piece. We'd both, he didn't like his carburetor. And the guy's got a lot of money, okay? It is. Well, we had to do it really clean. One of the rules were, yeah, you know, one of the rules were, yeah, we could drill a couple of holes in the trunk, but we had to do everything in our power not to modify the car, okay? So about the only holes I drilled was to get the suck line out of the tank, up to the fuel pump, and then we brought the lines back down and all the way forward in stainless and up into the engine car in stainless, and then I just rubber plumbed it into my fuel injection piping. It happened to be a dead and not a great way to do fuel, but if you don't want to modify the car, that's the way I did it. It was a deadheaded system. But guys, you really can mega squirt a car in a week with a friend. The first one's a little bit of a learning curve, by the way, is a, a bet against uh, Hot Rod Magazine. We showed up to the last mega squirt meeting. I had no idea. I walked in. Somebody yelled, Whittle, get over here. You're in charge. We had a car that just barely ran. It was a squirted car that ran, but we changed it completely out. All new fuel pumps, everything. Brought it up, tuned it, and drag raced it the next weekend. But the guy that we did it for drove that car home 25 hours later while we were at a mega squirt meet like this. Now, granted, we weren't looking at manuals. Trust me, we had enough horsepower around that somebody could jump under the hood and hook the blue wire up and the green wire ready to go, rock and roll. Nobody asked many questions other than how the hell are we going to do this? Okay, but we fabbed everything. One of the rules were it all had to be with tools that you could find around a typical garage. We did it with an aluminum MIG welder, a file, a grinder, and nitrous was kind of cool. And I think he ran like on a six cylinder straight six old Maverick. We ran, I think it was like, we, those guys tuned it, but on nitrous, controlled by the squirt, they got to like 12.5 in the quarter mile, okay? Oh, they did put headers on it before they got to that. But we drove it, he drove it home that night, Saturday night, and I showed up Friday at about 3.30. So this stuff can be done. I've seen Bruce, myself, and about two others wired up at one of these. We had a V8. All we walked in was a pile of wires and a squirt, and we had the thing running probably in an hour and a half. Didn't run good. There was a couple problems with the motor. But, okay, there's also another cool tool. Pete, go ahead. This uh, is a crimping tool. I, I, I mentioned uh, correct terminals and tooling for these terminals. That seems trivial, but when people wire cars, they usually wire them badly. They don't have a lot of experience. Um, these aren't these terminals are not decorator colors. They actually have a, a reason they have different colors. And most people know that, but if you don't know that, you can be in a lot of trouble. The reds are are from 22 to 18 gauge. The blues are from 16 14. The yellows are 12 to 10 gauge. Uh, the, the crimp terminals actually have little dots to tell you what color. And these terminals can be extremely reliable if they're used correctly. Um, so get the right tool and these are, I think these are less like $30 grasping peppers. They've got industry standard dies that you can change, you can spark plug wire dies, and you can get weather pack dies for weather pack terminals. Uh, one other thing I'll tell you about is we, I buy this from Keg Laboratories in the city. Uh, the oxid paste, a special antioxidant paste, it's filled with uh, powdered copper. And I use it for browns, I use it sometimes in I'll actually dip the wire in before I'll crimp it onto the terminal. And it significantly reduces the resistance of the connection and stays that way for a long time. The copper bites in, and the antioxidant compound protects it. 
of the more resistant fins. Very, very good stuff. And highly recommend it. Uh, it's called Keg Laboratories. C A I G. Uh, they keep changing the name of it, unfortunately. But, yeah, and I think also uh, these two cells, copper shields. But this has, they make a product called Deoxys Spray. And we call it Technician in Can because it actually does clean up switches and reduces, and actually, we actually measure the effect of the source analyzer. It really works. And this is the concentrated version of that deoxid mixed with copper. So it's chemically a special NASA developed. Not that it's necessarily good, but in this case it is. Um, good compound. But if you do a Google search on CAIG, K, they've got a number of different, some with copper and some that have no, nothing but the paste, or like switches where you don't want to short out. You can use it as a, as a terminal protector. And what I'll do is I'll dip a wire in this, and I'll crimp and I'll pass the wire around just so you can see that it's been crimped. You know, go ahead and try to pull it apart and see that it's actually crimped on well. And that's, you know, but remember this color coding and get good quality terminals. Actually, you can buy uh, 3M or AMP terminals at the show at Kmart of all places. You can actually buy main brand good quality crimp terminals at Walmart and 3M brand. Yeah, and so it came on. They have a, they have a crappy crimper, but, uh, but you can't buy the terminals there. The distributors should, should I, I recommend the distributors carry a ratcheting crimper like this and have it in their wiring section. Autos have those. I mean, the distributors, the mega square distributors, can't pin to carry this tool or, or a tool like it. So, anyway, I'll pass this around. Thank you. We're almost done. We're running out of time, so we're going to have to shorten this up a little bit, but a lot of it will be readable. I think we're going to post this on the net somewhere.